it really is about capturing your own personalities. And I know people say that, but ultimately that really is all it is. And I think some people are kind of stumped with that because they think that they're not particularly interesting people. You know, they're like, I'm not as interesting as those people who did that. It's not true. There's always something that I think you can extrapolate from your own lives. Like we, we had a couple who they're like, we just love to cook together. And so they ended up doing this little recipe book to give people as their favor. And it was lovely because that's what they're known for. They were at the time known for having these fabulous dinner parties where all the food was always simple but delicious and everyone always wanted their recipes. Yeah. So that was something that I thought was kind of lovely and didn't cost a thing. We are sitting with Melissa Haggerty, who is the event planner for Spectacular Spectacular, who was also a guest on season two, episode number 19 of the VIP Collective. That was shot in the Bahamas pre-pandemic in February. It's nice to see you virtually, although I like seeing you in person. Oh, agreed. Nice really to see you again. To remind me that we shot something in the Bahamas. That was a fun podcast, though. It was, it was good. beautiful, and it was really fun to learn about your story. Um, although, and, although you and I both learned to sit up straighter and not be in comfy chairs. We were engulfed by the most comfortable white chairs. There's been, there has been a lot of learning when it comes to shooting a video podcast. <laughs> and yes, it always is about back straight, right? Oh my God, I saw the pictures. I, I remember I said to you, I'm like, oh my God, Corinne, you look enormous. And I look like I have boobs the size of watermelons. I was going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> I know, I know. No, it was I not know. Yeah. I know. We both kind of looked at it. We're like, what happened? <laughs> what happened? We were comfy. We were comfy and we had a good chat. And uh, it was fun to learn a lot about your background, even though I know a lot of it because we have worked together for so many years. Um, the thing that came up the most during our podcast really was about personalizing a wedding. Now we were in the Bahamas for a wedding and there was a lot of personal touches that were infused into that. And we did speak about a few of those. And so I wanted to come back to the personalization of a wedding because I think a lot of times people hear it and they're like, I don't know what that means, a personalized wedding. Um, I know I want it to look pretty and I want people to have fun, but I don't know what it means to put any personality into it. So this is something you've done for years. Uh, with a lot of your clients. And so I thought maybe we could talk through some of the examples and also just how you start learning from your clients about them to be able to put that personal touch in motion. So right off the top, let's get into it. Um, for sure. And let's start with the scenario that somebody is now engaged, they've booked with you. And how do you start creating that comfort zone so that someone can start opening up a bit to really understand what they're about as a couple and how you can infuse little things into their wedding? Well, that, that's a good question. And it's a good question because there isn't like a pat answer, which is that for some of my clients, it took months to really sort of get a feel for their personalities and what was important to them and what was not important to them. Um, family dynamics, of course, always played into it. Um, so often we were appeasing many, many people, not just in one family, but you know, the bride's family, it could have been with the groom's family, all of those things. But um, the long answer is that it always was different for every single couple. And it started whenever they would sign with us with a five page, que five -page questionnaire we would send off. And in it, um, we asked all sorts of questions, but it helped to shape the form of their wedding that was going to come down the road. And, you know, it started off with things like, um, do you see yourself having a religious ceremony or a spiritual ceremony? And that told me a lot right away because sometimes families had to get married in a church or a synagogue and there was no getting around that. Questions like how big is your bridal party? <laughs> Sounds like a really innocuous one, but all I can tell you is that when the answer was like 15 bridesmaids and 28 groomsmen, I knew I had to charge more money because it was like wrangling cats on the day of. I needed extra people to help me assemble this village. Um, but as it got into more of the, um, the aesthetics, we would, we would say like describe, actually an important thing I asked for was describe your own personal taste. So if I were to walk into your home, what did it look like? What did it feel like? People love that question because of course, sometimes their wedding was an extension of that. Sometimes it wasn't. And then I got into 
what is, um, what's your vision for the wedding? And we would give them words like romantic, modern, you know, uh, different, different sorts of adjectives. And people would often use exactly what we suggested. And sometimes people would elaborate and write long sentences in the space that was allotted. Another thing, another section was we asked people to rank what was most important to them um, in order of, um, well, it was like from one to five. And we gave them categories like, was photography the most important thing to you? Was design the most important thing? What about food? Because that helped us to know how to distribute a budget. And sometimes personality came through food. And sometimes personality came through the flowers. And sometimes it came through stationery. But it was always the opportunity for people to tell us what they thought they needed or wanted and needed versus the other way around. And very often people didn't necessarily know what they wanted, but they knew what they didn't want. So they were able to put those things in there. But that section um, where people were asked to rank was very funny because I used to get like one through five from the bride. And then quite often, well, you'd assume if there was just one list, it was what was important to the two of them. But then sometimes I would get a list from the bride and then I would get a list from the groom and they were not the same whatsoever. And then one time I got a third column and it was the mother of the bride's list of important things, which by the way, right away, right there, you know, oh, this is going to be interesting <laughs> because right, right. this person really thinks she has a voice. Um, <laughs> as an aside, one of the most important things in that questionnaire was, is there anything we should know about like what we're walking into with family dynamics? And that came later on. We added that section in because so often we were work- walking into like quicksand you know, like the mother of the bride hated the mother of the groom and you didn't know that till the wedding day. And then you were trying to diffuse stuff. So it just, if you'd known ahead of time, that was, that was, you know, would have been really helpful. Um, but getting back to the personalization, we touched a little bit about this in our, um, the podcast from the Bahamas, which is sometimes ideas came right away and sometimes they came at the last minute and it was always up to my poor team to scramble And like my genius ideas would usually come a week to 10 days out as we were really focused in on these clients. And um, one of the greatest examples is Yuriko and Ritesh, their their, um, place card wall. Yep. So I imagine you'll show some sort of visual about this, but she was half Japanese, half Irish, and he was Indian. So we did origami flowers that um, for each and every single guest that then went onto this wall that poor stems had to design and build. So it's not just that I had to, we had to find the origami artist um, to make the flowers. Now you <laughs> did also, this 10 days out? I think it was a week out. Like it was crazy. Right. <laughs> yes. So Kat who worked for us, she, she discovered that there's an origami society of of Toronto like who knew that right (laughs) anyway so we found some guy who was able to make I think it was like 275 of them oh wow and then poor paper and post would send me um the size of the leaf that was going to be attached because the flower was going to be attached to the wall but then this um the leaf was going to have like the person's name and the table number anyway they were sending me different leaves and I would say send it to me size as I'd print it off and I'd hold it up next to the little um example flower to see about scale and balance anyway and then yeah like I said poor poor stems had to build a wall and make a trellis and (laughs) at least you don't choose complicated projects 10 days out (laughs) sarcasm sarcasm Sarcasm. yeah yeah Um, but I'm assuming the reason that happens because I've been on site with you and I've been to weddings with you and I just know that you're very observant and you're a listener with all of your clients and you you have a relationship with them so my guess is 10 weeks out, you're spending the most time with them at this point, or 10 days out, sorry, you're spending the most time with them probably that you have uh, over the course of the year. And so they're probably dropping little hints and they're saying things that That's they true. enjoy or that their family enjoys together. And all of a sudden you come up with this idea and you're like, we could do this based on what you just said. It's kind of like one of those situations where you're observing listening. 
for sure. And, and, and also you're right. Like in the last three weeks, things are really amping up here, talking to them daily, if not multiple times a day. Um, you're sitting down really like zoning in on the final preparations and, you know, sometimes it's, it's not even about decor. Sometimes it's a hilarious detail. Like we had a bride, actually you shot this wedding too, where I guess the mother used to say to her throughout her whole life, when the mother would have something exciting to, to tell her, she'd start the conversation on the phone with, bring out the mariachi band, this is going to happen. And so I heard that and I was like, oh my God, we should have a mariachi band. And not only did we have a mariachi band, um, <laughs> we had only. three times the- <laughs> three times that day. So it was a complete surprise to the bride. So as she was leaving her house, all ready to go to the church to get married, there was a mariachi band playing in her driveway. And of course, that just brought her to her knees. She she thought that was so funny because it was an inside joke with the family. Mm -hmm. And then I had the mariachi band playing as everyone exited the church. So I can't imagine what the guests thought. They would have been like, Hmm. Beautiful Catholic ceremony in a church and there's a mariachi band playing out here. Yeah. And then by the time everyone arrived at the venue, we had put out a purple sparkle carpet in front of the National Club, which is a very, dare I say, traditional place. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think they'd ever had a purple sparkle carpet, but at the top of the purple sparkle carpet, I had my mariachi band. (laughs) That was just, it was hysterical. And all the, everyone walking by, all the pedestrians were like, stop and look like, what is going on? A hundred percent. Like you didn't expect that outside the the club. Yeah. Yeah. So, but and see that was something you picked up. Correct. Correct. And that was not in the questionnaire originally. And you know, sometimes it's really true. People don't necessarily, nothing, nothing really happens at the beginning because it's all a process of us getting to know each other and also them learning how to put trust in me as well. So when I suggest things like, let's do a mariachi band, by that point, they, they've seen the beautiful stationery and they've seen the samples for the decor and they're like, okay, maybe we should let her go with this. Um, one of my favorite, 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 favorite moments um, talking about music was the first wedding we did at um, the Crystal Ballroom, the recently mm-hmm. renovated Crystal Ballroom mm-hmm. at the King Eddie Hotel. King Edward. And um, that, so quick aside, my stepmother, at the beginning of my career, I did my first wedding, one of my, well, very early, I did a wedding downstairs at the King Eddie. And my stepmother said, oh, is it in the the ballroom on the top floor. And I said, there's no ballroom on the top floor. She goes, oh yes, there is. I had my debutante ball there. <laughs> I'm like, no. Anyway, so sure enough, there was one there and it had been closed since 1977 or something. So being able to be the first uh, wedding back in there, to this day, like the hair will still stand up on my arms when I think about that wedding because the room was built for orchestras. And in fact, if people don't realize this, you walk underneath the mezzanine to get into the bigger space. And the mezzanine was for the full orchestras. So we decided we needed an orchestra. And I don't know if you remember, Corinne, but like the music in that space, because the room was built for that. The mm-hmm. acoustics were made for orchestras. Mm-hmm. Like the whole night, it was just this big band, fantastic stuff. And I just... Oh, so right, right there, like you set an ambience, ambience that people don't see every every day, right? Mm-hmm. And they're okay. the orchestra's up in the mezzanine. They're also elevated, so you can look up. Like they're performing for, for for you up there, and yet you can still have your conversations. And Precisely. you know, it's really got them removed, but also, like you said, with the ambience in the room, it was just filling the room with the, the sound. Well, and, and you touch on a good point, which is often when there's a band and they're playing during dinner, you really have to be able to control the speakers all around the room because great aunt so-and-so is sitting next to, his, next to a speaker over here and she wants it turned down and somebody else on the other side wants it turned up. But this was just acoustic big band and it was like chills. It was so beautiful. Okay, but not only was it a big band, what happened? I'll let you fill everyone in. Uh, oh, yeah, what yeah, yeah, happened? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, our groom 
thought he would surprise his bride and sing with the big band. Mm-hmm. And he he's well, he's a total Renaissance man, right? Like he can do anything. And of course, he turns up in his white Tom Ford dinner jacket and he looks like James Bond. And and he got up there and he started to sing Fly Me to the Moon. And he, he nobody announced him. He just started to sing. And the day before he was about to go to, to practice with the band. And he called me afterwards. He's like, Melissa, I don't think I can do it. They're, they're playing in, in Frank Sinatra's key. That's not my key. So I don't think it's going to sound good. And I said, oh, I get it. But when are you ever going to sing, have the chance again to sing with a 20 piece band? And so he's like, you're right. And of course, it ended up being one of the most special moments of, of that wedding, right? Because there was no fanfare. He just started to sing. And he looked like, he looked like a crooner from the 50s. Like, it oh, was yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah. She was, I've, I don't know if I've seen a smile so big. Like, yeah. that was such a surprise for her. It was really, it was a really cute moment and a really neat way to kick off something in that room because it was the first wedding when they opened. That's so. right. Some of the guests, when... Um, they were in that room and they were listening to the big band and having this very chic dinner in this beautiful place. One of the guys said to me, he's like, I would pay to come here if they did this on Friday nights. Like this would just be like, everybody had chills because we just felt like the groom wrote to me the next day. He's like, I think we did right by the crystal ballroom. Right. Like we, we had a, we had, we had a responsibility to do something beautiful the first time Mm -hmm. out after Mm -hmm. 50 years or whatever it was hit the nail on the head pretty close yeah but I want to stick on a word that you just said which Mm. is chills Ah. I like this word and um something I think that a lot of times in your weddings with guests as well they feel that chill and not because it's drafty (laughs) not because it's cold (laughs) I mean, the heat's not working. (laughs) The heat's not working. Uh, The chill of emotion. So how, how do you do that? What's, what's something you do that you feel that guests really kind of resonate with? Well, I think an area that people don't pay enough attention to is the ceremony. Because that's really the one time of the entire day where everyone is really focused. No one has anything else to do except sit and watch people get married or listen to the music or whatever. But think about it like during speeches, they're eating or they're drinking or they're chatting with other people. But the ceremony is a really a place where you have a captive audience. And some of our most memorable weddings have been where the ceremonies knocked the wind out of people. And usually just by just power, the power of the commitment, the power of music, that's a huge part of it, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes it was just really feeling the why, the why these two people were committing to each other. And it's not about money. It's, It's about like really honing in on something that moves people, which we were able to do time and time again during ceremonies. So then my question to you, based on ceremony, is if you're in a church, and you don't get a lot of control with your ceremony, let's say. You have the readings and then, of course, your vows, which most of the time you're repeating after a priest. How do you try and infuse a little bit of yourself into the ceremony if you're in a church? Um, There's one word. It's music. And so it's always been a challenge because, and rightfully so, ceremonies in in, um, religious places are controlled by the clergy, whether it's a rabbi, whether it's a minister, whether it's um, an imam, like they're just, they've got their rules. And the one place where you can really break free is music. So sometimes it's a soloist with a beautiful voice. Sometimes it's a choir. And I argue, I will, I will fight to the death. Like, I don't care how old you are, how jaded you are, but the sound of multiple voices together coming in song can often bring people to tears when it's done properly. So we did a wedding when we didn't shoot. I'm so sorry. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, in one of the biggest churches in Toronto, St. Paul's on Bloor Street. And um, it's, it's a big church. I don't even know what the capacity is. There are 2,000 people or something. Mm-hmm. And um, the dad really wanted a choir. And so they had um, 
the Toronto Mendelssohn Choir, and I think there was 36 or 38 voices that came in to sing. Whoa. And it was crazy beautiful. And then they also had a soloist. Her name was Jackie Richardson. She's like an old school, like, belter of a um, diva. And she came and sang. And I'm telling you, I can't remember what song she sang. It'll come to me. But it, um, people were just blown away by the music because that's where the personality came through. And you know what's interesting? Because everybody always says, it's not what you say, it's how you made them feel. That's right. You know that saying? And so yep. people probably, especially because I know we worked on one together, which you're probably going to talk about, but was the surprise choir that you had. And I think that like people are probably still talking about that because it was something, it was a shock and awe moment. And it also was sounded beautiful because it had that gospel tone to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, well, let's set that one up. That was a Jewish boy marrying a Hindu girl. So we dubbed it our Hindu wedding. And um, Hindu? Yeah. I didn't hear that one. You didn't know that one? Um, it was at the Brickworks. It was outside. And the, the rabbi and the, um, the priest, the Hindu priest, really worked hard ahead of time to bring their two ceremonies together to make it cohesive so that it wasn't like there was one full ceremony of one and one full of the other. They really brought it together. And what was so interesting is like um, there's a mandap in the Hindu religion, which is a four-posted marital structure. Think about the chuppah in the Jewish faith, right? Mm -hmm. So there were so many similarities, which really until they put it all together, everyone's like, wow, we're not so different after all. Hmm. Terrible for life. But anyway, so um, I have had friends in, in the congregation for that one, actually former, former clients. And they were like, that was the best ceremony we've ever seen because everyone learned a little bit about each other's religions. So the Jewish people had no idea what happens in a you know, a Hindu wedding and vice versa, but they got a little bit of everything. And then um, the rabbi Aviva with the beautiful voice, I'm telling you, like she starts to sing and I don't know, the clouds open up, right? And birds start to like fly. It's, it's beautiful. So it was a really great and very moving ceremony to begin with, educational too. Um, but the minute it was over and he stepped on the, the glass at the end, we had a full-on gospel choir starts singing in the back and they had sort of snuck into position after you know while um while this was all going on and i think did they start with happy for i, think, think, so. I think so and i'm happy yeah yeah so it was just another thing where people like turned around and there was this full gospel choir singing away so that was it was beautiful and, and it's the, what's really cool too and what i really like about that is it's just the energy. Oh, bless you. <laughs> COVID times, man. Everyone's at home, right? We are not alone. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, the energy when, so they walked in, they had the recessional and then the guests are all up and they did, I think they did what, five or six songs afterwards? Yep. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. And so it was like creating this like excitement and happiness and everyone's hugging and when we could hug. And yes. Like, you know, and it Back just kind of, hug, yeah. it kept the excitement alive post, after the recessional, which I found really, really nice. Well, and what was cool is it like, for me, that's always like a harbinger of things to come. And I always like to build the night too. So of course that wasn't like the biggest thing of the whole evening, but that was, that was just a really beautiful way to start and be like, this is who we are. And why not throw in a gospel choir, right? <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, so the gospel choir came up how? Or was that a... You know, I don't remember anymore. I I think it was the groom said something in jest about, or maybe I, would t I told a story about a gospel choir. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. See, that's another thing. You're a very good storyteller. So when you're telling stories, then people are th like, they're kind of thinking of ideas because well, that might be something that would work with us. <laughs> Maybe. So like one of you, we were talking about um, a choir I did at the AGO. Mm -hmm. yep. And that was actually the second choir I did there because um, I told that couple about the choir I'd done for someone else. And that had really come out of 
um, this is actually interesting. So something beautiful came out of something that was almost necessary, which was the bride was terrified she would not make it up the aisle because she was not one of those, look at me, look at me, look at me. She didn't think she'd be able to walk up an aisle. So I came up with the concept sort of like, you know, when you distract people mm -hmm. and they're not noticing that she's coming closer. Um, so I had in Walker Court, uh, the choir come out from underneath the staircase, but go around the sides. And then there were three singers in each um, archway. And all they did as they came out was that they hum, they hummed Amazing Grace. So they weren't even singing yet. Mm -hmm. And so that was really beautiful. And of course, we held the rehearsal the day before, which the client had to pay for because, of course, I'm never going to do something like that without like making sure there's military precision as they come out, then they stop and they turn and then they walk to their positions. Nothing happens by chance. But um, I think we had 16 people for that one. And then they continued to walk around and anyone that knows the space, they then came up to the entrance and then they they met at the top the two the two sides the two singers and then everyone was behind them and then they would file down the wheelchair ramps into position and then by the time everyone realized they'd stopped watching this theater which was the singing the movement the spectacle they didn't even realize that the bride was at the top of the stairs and she had like 20 feet to walk right so it was it was very beautiful so when it came time, when I was telling the story of this, this wedding, the next couple were like, is it okay if we have a choir too? Can we do the exact same thing? <laughs> and I remember saying, yes, but I think you need 20 voices. I, 16 was fine, but I think you need 20. So we did 20 and that's the one you saw. That was a chill moment. That was a chill moment. It yeah. was. Yeah. And that's the kind of like, just that lasting. And then it's the same with films. I mean, we're always trying to give the chills. I always like to have the chills before sending out a film, just so I know that it's got that kind of emotion with it. And I just feel like on your wedding day, depending, I guess, on the vibe you're going for, if it's romantic, then you kind of want to leave your guests with that, with that feeling. Totally. You want to hear my best chill story? Yes. So I had a couple who were getting married at the... Um, Royal Conservatory of Music. And the first time we toured the place, the groom confided in me that he had spent 10 years of his life taking piano lessons at the conservatory. <laughs> and so I looked at him right then and there, I'm like, well, you need to play her down the aisle then. And the long, the short version of the long story is that these two called off their wedding, I think two months before the actual big day. And we were all really devastated because there's just couples that you relate to and connect with more than others. And they were one of our all time favorites. Anyway, um, they went off and they worked on their relationship and I don't think this is the norm, but they set a new date. <laughs> and even that's a good story, but I won't get into that because that's not about the, the <laughs> chills moment. Um, anyway, so the time comes and he's been practicing on the piano all these years because now it's like two and a half years after we met by the time they're actually getting married. And uh, we, we held a f the real rehearsal first. So the real rehearsal was um, the officiant, the bride, the groom, the photographer and the videographer, because you know me, I never want anyone to be surprised by uh -huh. anything. So uh -huh. I, I couldn't surprise the videographer with like something that was going to happen. Uh -huh. um, and so everyone knew where, what everyone was going to do and where everyone was going to be in order to capture what was going to happen the next day. And then we held the fake rehearsal. So the, the families came in, the, um, the wedding parties on both sides came in, and we went through the whole thing. And only one groomsman said, is that piano going to stay right there? And I said, oh, well, um, it's a conservatory. So... Um, the truth is I can't actually get it out of the room. It's such a big piano. I can't get it out of the room. Not entirely a lie, but that wasn't really true. Mm -hmm. So the next day um, we start the ceremony and uh, I think it was a, it was a 
cello and a guitar playing the music. And so the groomsmen came in, the bridesmaids came in, the groom walked his grandmother up the aisle, she sat down, and then the minister said something unusual, the officiant. He said, could everyone please remain seated for the entrance of the bride? And I know why they did that, because they wanted everyone to see what was going to happen. So at that moment, the groom walked over to the piano, lifted the lid, and started to play. And he played Bruno Mars, um, and when I see your face, there's not a thing that I would change. I think you're amazing, just the way you are. Yes, so, and he played it slow on the piano. So, you know, it's one of those, like, everyone knows the song, but they don't really, anyway. So mm -hmm. we had practiced the day before too, because I had to get her to the top of the aisle at the exact moment in the song where the lyrics, if there were lyrics, if he was singing, he wasn't, say, and when I see your face. Sure. So um, at the exact moment, the 40 seconds out, I sent her with her, with her two parents, who of course, I don't even think they noticed that the groom was playing because we practiced the day before and he wasn't playing. And she did something that she hadn't done the day before, which was that she kept her head down the whole way until she got to the top of the aisle. And then at that moment in the song, he looked up, she looked up, they saw each other for the first time on their wedding day and the crowd went nuts, but not like, not like clap, clap, clap. People were bawling. Oh, like wow. not, I, I kind of felt bad <laughs> because people were like doing like the, the really messy cry. You're like, <laughs> we have pictures of the bridesmaids who are like, it's full on ugly cry. The groomsmen were ugly crying. And I think so much of it was because of the backstory too, which was, that they'd been through so much they had called off a wedding and then they worked on their relationship and they came back together and like it just meant even more so that time where I kind of joked that he should play her up the aisle years before had so much more meaning this time around wow. and so I, and I always say like what do you think everyone remembers from that particular wedding that North 44 catered Lydia did the flowers everything was perfect everything was amazing but they're always going to remember that ceremony and it didn't cost a thing. They remember the feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And when wow. I see your face. Yeah. So that was like the best one. Very cool. And yeah. a little stressful on your part, like 40 oh, yeah. seconds out during the song. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I can't tell you how often I have to really time music. So I, because every aisle is a certain length, every, and well, part of that is the first time I did a gospel choir which is a pretty funny story in the church. The groom joked one time and it was at Bishop Strong Chapel, which looks like a little old English uh, church. And the groom was like, ha oh, ha, we should have a gospel choir. And of course I'm like, I love that. This is the beginning of my career, like probably year two. And so I found a gospel choir. Actually, I think he found the choir and then I had to talk to the guy and there was no practice the day before. And we had to get us, we had to get a CD player hooked up and they played to a track. And so this, the track starts and uh, I'm sending everybody up the aisle. And then the bride stood there for about four minutes while the CD track just <laughs> kept playing because <laughs> there was no control over that. And I was on the complete wrong side of the chapel. I couldn't get over there to be like, <laughs> turn it down a bit but ever since that moment I, I learned that I had to be like a military sergeant in terms of like knowing exactly how long a processional was going to take and so that you would never trust on a, a cd player or use a cd player <laughs> obviously uh, this was uh, a few years ago but yeah yeah like I said at the beginning but yeah yeah so yeah. while there have been many uh gospel choir since I have never made that mistake again well, another interesting one that we worked on together, and we did talk about uh, in your previous podcast, but was with Stephanie Mark and the hidden audience member who was actually a singer yeah. from a band, and walk us through that one. And how did that come up? How did that idea? That was the bride and groom, and they said that very early on, I think like one of our first meetings, that they wanted to do that scene from Love, Love Actually, and... Uh, I think I told you back then that I was surprised that nobody had ever asked for that yes. ever. So as the time got closer and closer, um, 
I realized we couldn't have a full band hiding in an audience because in the church, in the movie, they were able to tuck their instruments under the pew. So people, excuse me, couldn't see that they were uh, musicians. But in the fermenting cellar with shivari chairs, I couldn't hide a trombone and I couldn't hide a trumpet. You know, like so. So we kept we kept the the horn section in the men's bathroom. And again, like everything had to be on cue, right? Like we had to know exactly um, when they would come out, what the cues were to get ready to come out, and. Um, the the rabbi or the officiant came the day before we worked out everything so when the singer would stand up what the answer would be so that she would you know leave it to all you need is love anyway it worked out really beautifully didn't it and there was a back and forth between the singer and then the uh the cantor and then um she asked the the people under the chuppah to sing and then the whole thing started and then the, the horn section blew out of the bathroom and <laughs> bathroom. <laughs> there was a and, lot of heads turning. That's yeah. Awesome. And just, and there was no other music actually, except the crowd singing all you need is love. Da, 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 da. Yeah. That yeah. was the cool part is everyone joined in and they were clapping. And so it was like, they were able to participate in the celebration. Correct. At the end. Right? Correct. And yeah. at the end of the day, what does everyone need? Hmm. Love love and love is all you need and that movie is on all the time now because of our time frame <laughs> being close to christmas that's true so when we were in the bahamas uh we talked a lot about that wedding and just some of the details that were infused into the wedding based on information you had about the family the groom was the particularly um sensitive one out of all of them like very mm. emotional in the sweetest possible way not in a sappy gross way but really very charming and uh anyway so they wanted to get married on the beach so i came up with the concept of having them get married in a circle of love because mm -hmm. it was just the two of them and the girl who married them her really good friend so I didn't need a big area. In the but circle, but there were guests. In the circle. There were guests. There were only 10 people there in total. So in three total. out of the 10 were standing <laughs> in the circle of love. <laughs> um, you should have seen those, those drawings too. I, was, I sketched things. I sent them to the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And then the, the guy who was ordering the plants, he's like, I think you need like 30 feet across. I'm like, because he thought I needed mm -hmm. everybody and the chairs in there. I was like, no, 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 no. So, oh my God. I should show you the drawing sometime. I'm, I've got measurements. I've got like, approximation of plants. Anyway, so we did a combination of plants and then we brought in just some, some wax flowers and stuff that just looked like it would be naturally growing around versus like orchids that just really don't grow in the Bahamas, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, right before the ceremony, I had I whispered to the officiant, to tell them that, um, actually, let me go back. Hold on. So, so they got married. It was beautiful. The officiant told them something about the circle of love that made everybody cry. <laughs> um, but we also used the circle of love for them to come to leave their, their wedding dinner and come mm -hmm. back at nighttime and have their first dance. And at that time I had torches all around the, um, circle of love so not only did they get married in the circle of love then they had their first dance just the two of them nobody else from the dinner even know that knew that they'd slipped away they were just going to take pictures with the photographer and obviously the videographer but um uh so we did that but the secret that the um officiant had told everybody there was that while they looked like plants that were buried in the sand they were actually trees and so um, two days later, the family planted five of them on the island and they'll grow to about 30 to 35 feet high. Hmm. So they'll always wow. be able to come back and visit the trees that were planted at their wedding. So as their family grows, the trees grow on the island. The circle of love lives on. Correct. On Kamalami Key in the Bahamas. Correct. But, you know, going back to your original question is like, how do I come up with these ideas? That wasn't like, I didn't say, find me some trees that I'm going to plant. <laughs> right. It's just, I realized that they were trees. And so I, I like how you people, said that. that was, <laughs> Lord, your voice even went deeper. <laughs> I know. Well, 
Um, no, so I can't even say that I was a genius. It's just like, I, I heard that they were trees and I was like, oh, wouldn't that be a lovely thing? So I asked for permission from the resort. Sure. They loved the course. And then it just ended up being even more special. So it, I can't say that it was, you know, me being all that smart. It just ended up happening. But I saw the opportunity and I made something extra special. So when did you decide to plant the trees? At what point? Um, it must have been within the last week when I found out that they were actually trees. And then I saw them when we got there. And I said, how tall are these going to grow? Mm. And the guy who ran the place, he's like, oh, they're 30 or 35 feet. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's cool. That so is that, cool. That's when it happened. So yeah, it was like typical me, like in the last few days. Okay, well, this has been really interesting. Now, obviously, what about advice? Let's say somebody listening now, they're engaged and they're like, okay, I like these stories. I feel like I can do something like this. What do you suggest they do to get, get the ball rolling? Well, you know, it really is about capturing your own personalities. And I know people say that, but ultimately that really is all it is. And I think some people are kind of stumped with that because they think that they're not particularly interesting people. You know, they're like, I'm not as interesting as those people who did that. It's not true. There's always something that I think you can extrapolate from your own lives. Like we, we had a couple who they're like, we just love to cook together. And so they ended up doing this little recipe book to give people as their favor. And it was lovely because that's what they're known for. They were at the time known for having these fabulous dinner parties where all the food was always simple but delicious and everyone always wanted their recipes. Mm. So that was something that I thought was kind of lovely and didn't cost a thing. Um, I'll go back to music and people always, people stumble over what their music should be for their ceremony. And some of the most, I mean, I've talked about um, performances and choirs and stuff, but some of the most powerful ceremonies I have seen has been when it is a pre-recorded, like the real track, the real singer from the radio um, being played. And the room is like shaking because it's loud and powerful. And like the, you, you cannot put any sort of price on that when people are actually like feeling it because they're like immersed in it. And there, some of them might be like, Oh, that's loud. But really <laughs> other people are like, wow. Yeah. Um, chills. Chills. Uh, I'm going to name when, the episode chills. I know when um, Mike Karinji got married, the photographer, uh-huh. They decided to mix things up a bit and I don't know why we did it this way originally, but they decided to have cocktails first and then get married. And so when that happened, um, I said, oh God, people are going to be so confused. So we did something quite funny. We had cocktail napkins throughout the evening that changed, telling people what to do. So the very first one during cocktails was um, eat up, dinner still a ways off. So you know how during cocktail hour, people are like, oh no, like, first of all, they didn't know that they weren't going right into a ceremony. So people were confused. So the staff had these napkins with the little cute little illustrations and it said, you know, eat up, dinner still a ways off. Um, so people did that. They're like, oh, okay, now I understand this. So they drank and they ate and then people just sat down in the seats that we had lounge style and watched them get married. Mm. But then one of the most beautiful things we did was we had everyone stand up at the time with the vows and we handed out um, a candle, like a taper candle to every single guest. And it was beautiful watching the flame be shared and moved around the room until the whole room was aglow. And again, that's not very expensive, right? But to look out at the, the candlelight, which was the guests were actually the, the candle holders, like that was really beautiful. And people's faces were illuminated by that um, yeah. for the actual vows, incredibly powerful. And again, very simple. Um, it's never a story from me without the funny aside to that, which is if this is the candle, yeah. they're like, they're holding them like this. 
And so we gave them like the little bobesh things to like capture the wax. Mm -hmm. But people were like standing like this. And I was like, oh my God, (laughs) the wax is dripping all over the floor. Oh no. (laughs) Lift the fucking candle. Just lift it. And then I was like, "Ah." anyway. (laughs) So at like three o'clock in the morning that night, my team and I were down on the ground using like credit cards to scrape the wax off the floor because I did not want to hear the cleaning bill we were going to get from, from that place with like, even and a, everything. I was like, what is wrong with people? Even as simple as holding a candle sometimes can be tough. We learn. <laughs> you try to think of everything that could possibly go wrong and you still get flummoxed by people. <laughs> One, one of the most famous stories in the city, which is a terrible story, was um, Michelle Reeves, who was a planner here. She's since moved back to Edmonton, but she did a beautiful wedding at Graydon Hall. And she designed these ice, ice cream bo- uh, vessels mm-hmm. and for dessert. So the, whole, the actual bowl was made out of ice cream. And then each one had a sparkler in it. And so the waiters brought them all in and it was this big, beautiful show. And what did people do? They took out their sparklers. They're like, waited till they went out and then they put them down on the tables. And you know that a sparkler is still burning hot, right? Yeah. All the, the linens got ruined. <gasps> oh. They all had holes in them. So oh, the no. entire product line was ruined. And so people... I don't know, just gallantly say, oh, well, the client just had to pay for that. But what they don't know is that the next wedding that had them booked didn't get their linens because everyone at the other wedding just put down their sparklers and burnt the entire line. So, yeah. Things you do not realize until until you're literally standing there watching it happen. I know. And there's no way with 200 people you could tell everyone to like, pick them up again. Mm -hmm. Lift them up, lift them up. Wow. Anyway, yeah. Wow. So you have a whole tell all behind the scenes book you could write. It's so true. I'm waiting for it, but <laughs> my late father begged me to write a book about all the things I've seen and done. I just remember one wedding you ran by me and you're like, the toilets are overflowing. <laughs> right. 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 Because guess what? It's it's my problem. It's your problem. I had to learn about toilets. Yeah. Oh my God. Or there was a beautiful wedding we did. Oh my God, this was so good. Um, on private property, you were there, even though I think you were working for Cloud9 at the time. And uh, we bled the well dry. The toilets, oh. yeah, emptied out the well. So suddenly there was no water. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you learn a lot about these things. <laughs> You're like, oh, there's a well on the property. Mm, not for 250 people to go to the bathroom 25 times a day. Oh, yeah, my goodness. Yeah. I grew up on a well, and I know how precious that water and conservative right. that water right. is when you say right. that, 250 people. Yeah. Anyway, thank God I had a tent guy on standby. And even though it was not his job, he was running around the property finding hoses to attach it to. And he eventually had to, like, take it up to the stables way up the road. to. We got our water back, but it wasn't without stress. No doubt. That's why you got to craft that team. So you oh, that's so that's so funny. You remember the story about the toilets? Yeah. No, I do because I remember thinking like, man, you have to deal with everything. Everything. Like, that's what I. And then I was like, how's she gonna fix that? <laughs> that was. And then I'm like, I don't know. I gotta go keep shooting. <laughs> that's right. But uh, the truth is, I probably didn't fix it. But I found the person that potentially could fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It still became your problem, right? Yeah. yeah. I have had to learn a lot about really weird things, so there's no question. And, and I will say this. I think that a lot of people, this is maybe a good place to end this, a good way to end this, is people spend a lot of money, effort, and time stressing about the decor and the beauty and um, the environment, which of course is important. Of course it is. But that isn't what people remember. People don't remember $2 million worth of flowers unless it was so gaudy. People are like, oh my God, (laughs) it was, right? You don't want to be remembered in a bad way. But I think the ceremony is the place where you really can have an impact on people. Mm -hmm. And that's where you really, I think it's a place that most people miss. 
that really like it starts usually starts there unless it was Mike and it started with cocktails and then a ceremony. But um, it really is a place that you can put your stamp on and really do something that people will remember your wedding by. Because most people, when you're of marrying age, are going to like four or five weddings in a year, right? And at some point, they all kind of meld together in your head. So it's those ones like the groom playing his bride down the aisle. Years later, I know that anybody who was there is still talking about that mm. because it was so beautiful. So it's a missed opportunity if people don't think a little more seriously about their ceremonies, which ultimately, hello, is what it's supposed to be about when you're getting married. Right? And it's, it's the first event of the day. It's the first thing your guests come to. But it's the thing that you're doing. It's the big statement. <laughs> <laughs> you are, and it's you are promising to love each other for the rest of your lives. It's, it's the expression the, of love. Yes. <laughs> and people just kind of gloss over it sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway. So. Well, hot tips, hot tips. Um, before I let you go, there is one other party that um, we had the opportunity to shoot with you. And it was super different, very unique. Now it wasn't a wedding. It was a birthday, excuse me. It was a birthday party and it had a zero to 60 theme. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And talk us through, and I'm going to share some of these details as well, just because it was, it was super unique. It was custom built. Um, but talk us through what the zero to 60 theme was. Why you did right. It. So going back to what you ask about and how things come about, um, it, that the concept that ended up happening didn't happen right away, but what did happen fairly soon once I met the, the, the family was that it was a 60th birthday party. The birthday boy loved cars. And so they came up with uh, the zero to 60 theme. And the wife had, had worked for um, Louis Vuitton in her past life. And so she had this um, illustrator that she loved to work with. So the illustrator, actually, I have this here because we, I knew we were going to talk about this. But so she came up with this cute little illustration of him in a red race car and it says zero to 60. That's cute. And I'm going to show everybody this because this, the concept of this is what led to the dinner and the environment there. And I think that's a nice way to sort of segue into. This is the first thing, which is the invitation, which then you can take through and, and build into something else. So basically the zero to 60 showed the road of his life. And it starts with him being born in Calgary and then he moves to Toronto and he studies in Switzerland and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they got married, his second marriage and their daughter was born. And then I love this. It says bumps ahead. Mm. Boom, 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 boom. So their daughter ended up having a brain tumor. She was in the hospital, I think for over a year, like not like a little casual brain tumor, a big one. And then he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So when they say bumps ahead, like it, it really was a rough few years for them. So this is a beautiful sort of metaphor for his life, which is the long road traveled. So then I don't know, I don't even know when I came up with it, but as a Formula One racing fan, I know a lot about cars and tracks and how they should look. Um, I decided we should make the tables like a racetrack. And then thinking that through a bit more, I was like, well, we obviously need bridges because if I'm going to have people sitting on both sides of the table, the racetrack, we have to be able to like the wait staff have to be go, go through it. And also the guests have to be able to go back and forth when they go to the bathroom, which yeah. hopefully doesn't break anyway. So um, that's where that came from. And Alan Bisson from Fire Dog Creative, like I don't know anyone else who could have helped me build that, but we did, we did technical drawings. They did all sorts of like, really, it, it was not some casual thing. And the client kept saying, is this going to work? Is this going to work? And I would be like, well, I think so. And then I call Alan and Alan's like, yeah, yeah, pretty sure it's going to work. Yeah, 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 I think so. Anyway, so over the Christmas holidays, he and his team were building the track and, and um, getting the wire. And anyway, they, um, uh, I made them do a full setup 
the week before, two, four days before, before we even moved into the Royal Conservatory, because I could not have these people come to dinner and then the cars wouldn't go around the track. And so, of course, we also had to make sure that they would go up the bridge and down the bridge, the bridge and not fall off the bridge. So, and um, the bridges had to be at least over six feet. Correct. Humans had to walk through, so they were ducking. So, like, there was quite the arc on the bridge as well. And, you know, you also had to take into consideration how far back the bridges had to start because the chairs couldn't come up to there, right? Um, so a lot of engineering went into that party. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it, was, it, was, it was so much fun because all these grown men were just, like, sitting there like this. Well, but cars go by. Exactly. I was going to yeah. say, you haven't mentioned that the cars were actually moving on the tracks. And so there were cars. That's right. They were actually the dinner moving table on the track. Yeah. Yeah. The entire evening with headlights. The cars had headlights. That's right. So obviously we slowed them down. They had headlights, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so delightful. Um, we obviously stopped them during speeches and stuff, but um, six cars were racing, racing around the track. Mm-hmm. And uh, I brought this out too, because we never showed this, but these were the escort cards that everyone picked up, which was you picked up your, your speeding ticket, which then told you what, what table or what section of the track you were sitting on. And then of course, like the table numbers were the things that go over a normal racetrack that usually have um, advertisements or sponsorships on them. So the whole thing was really, really fun. That must've been fun for you creatively to just super fun but clients look at you and they're like am I really going to spend this much on something that may not work I'm like I think it will (laughs) yeah I'll die trying yeah I'll put some I'll put some clips uh over top as well so that people can just see because it was such a cool creation and yeah it was three to four days I think putting it together because I remember coming down days prior just to see that's right but the, the tablecloths had to be custom because, of course, the curves in the table were different for the different um, parts of the track, mostly to make it look like a racetrack, too, so not a perfect oval. Um, but I remember we, we got it the day before, got the space the day before, and the linens had been printed um, from Emerson, and one section of it had been sewn together backwards. So everything was correct, but it was assembled backwards but thank god we were in the day before because i put it in an uber sent it back to mississauga and they came back anyway so these are all things that yeah and that good advice to any planners out there if you're doing something that's never been done before buy yourself a little extra time for Mm -hmm. stuff that will inevitably go wrong and when like i knew the the guest list so that was there the people that were there and those people are seasoned party goers right and they were all blown away so that was that was kind of fun too Mm-hmm. Well, it was definitely a unique spin on a 60th birthday. There's no question. This has been super helpful. And I think a lot of people are going to love listening and hearing these stories of I hope so. personalizing. Think about, the ceremony. think about the ceremony, the takeaway, and leave them with the chills. And leave them with, yep, stuff that they'll never forget. In a good way, though. We have to say that. <laughs> stuff in a good way. Chills in a good way, yes. <laughs> the yes. good chills. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, dear. Okay. We'll see you next time. Bye, honey. Bye.